Okay, so welcome. Critical thinking today we are talking about definitions and different kinds of definitions. Um, last time we talked about the course outline, about various formalities, how you have to participate in this course and, and what you have to do for it. And um, today we have lots of things to cover about definitions. What is a definition? What is a correct definition? Descriptive, stipulative definitions, intentional and extensional definitions, um, genus and different circular definitions and definition errors. So let's begin. I will try to keep it short, but this is probably not going to be short. So uh, take some time to do this. So first we want to see what does definition even mean. Um, so this is an exercise and like with all these exercises, you should stop the video here. Um, you should try for yourself to think what does definition mean and then um, give me, you know, an answer uh, and, and then look at the answer, right? Don't uh, directly go to the answer because if you directly go to the answer, you miss the opportunity to actually use this um, to exercise. The final exam will be exercises like that, right? So you should get, should get used to um, actually doing these exercises before you look at the answer. And then second, after you define, you know, definition, you should also define knife, elephant, kitchen, table and air. So now stop the video here, do this, write your definitions down. Uh, if you are with your friends together, you can do it in a group and then continue and compare your answers with the answers that I will give you. Okay, here we go. Um, first, uh, actually, I don't give you the answer later. So um, first you will notice when you try to give a definition, you should try to be as precise as possible. So let's use these examples, right? If I say, for example, a knife is something that cuts, this is not a very good definition because something that cuts, it could be a knife, it could be a sword, it could be uh, scissors, right? So these are all things that cut. Uh, it could be a, a razor. Um, so this is not very good. So you have to be precise, as precise as possible. And this is why a definition we say, we say should ideally include only one object, that which you wish to define, and it should exclude everything else, right? So if I define knife, I should ideally find a definition that includes only knives and excludes everything else. But this is difficult, right? It's very difficult to do. Um, the same with kitchen, you know, sometimes people say when you define kitchen, you say a kitchen is a place where I can cook. Um, this is not a very good definition if you think about it, because you can cook uh, outside. You can cook on a beach. You can cook at a barbecue place on a beach. This is cooking, but it's not a kitchen, right? Or you can, uh, you know, eat hot pot in your living room. Uh, then you are cooking. The hot pot is actually cooking in front of you in this living room, but this doesn't make the living room a kitchen. So um, you have to be really precise. But then a table, for example, demonstrates the other problem, that you might be too precise, you might try to be too specific. Many people would say table is a kind of furniture with four legs. This is too much to say, right? Because not all tables have four legs. There are many tables with three legs, there are tables with one leg in the middle, right? If you think of a, a bar table or a table on a coffee shop outside, you know, where you drink coffee, this is often a kind of metal table, right, that has only one leg. So four legs is then too specific. Um, so you need to be a little careful about uh, not being too specific and also not being too general. Okay. <clears throat> um, so for example, when I say a pen is something which writes, I can clearly see this is not a good thing because it's too general. It applies to pencils and brushes and to my little brother who is writing a letter to his friend, right? He's also writing something that writes, but my brother is not a pen. Um, but now I can say a pen is an instrument for writing which has a hard tip through which ink is applied onto the paper. And if I say it in this way, you can immediately see that this is much better, right? Uh, is an instrument for writing, excludes my little brother, um, hard tip excludes the brushes, ink excludes the pencils, uh, 
And so I'm already pretty far, you know, on the way of defining a pen and excluding everything else. And ink is applied into the paper. Uh, onto the paper includes both ball pens and fountain pens. So I avoid being too specific and perhaps talking only about one kind of pen and not the other, right? So this is a good definition. Um, but you can almost always find flaws in definition. So it's not like you can have a perfect definition. If you think about it, every definition is flawed in some way. And this is okay as long as the definition fulfills its purpose. And now you will ask, okay, what is the purpose of a definition? Think about it for a second. What, stop the video again. What is the purpose of the definition? If you think about it, right, why do we use definitions? We use definitions not because we don't know what the thing is, right? Normally, you wouldn't have someone who doesn't know what a knife is and ask you to define it. The purpose of a definition is to agree with somebody else about the use of the word. So you say, I want to buy a knife, and you are in a shop, and you both roughly know, you and the shopkeeper, what a knife is. But he happens to have swords and scissors and knives and, and big knives and small knives. And when you say, I want to buy a knife, you need to somehow agree on what kind of thing you are interested in. And so the most common purpose of a definition is to make sure the two parties agree on the meanings of the words they use. And if the definition can achieve that, then it is good enough. So you don't need to argue with the shopkeeper about the definition of a sword if he already knows what you want to buy, right? So the definitions only have to be good enough to enable us to communicate with other people. They don't have to be perfect and they cannot be perfect. So there are different kinds of definitions now. Um, the first kind are descriptive definitions. Descriptive definitions describe, this is why they call it descriptive, how a word is used. Okay? There's some Chinese there. I hope it's right. It's from my wife, actually. I'm not sure if this actually means descriptive definition. We just trust her to do it right. So, um, you will understand. So, they can be right or wrong. Okay? Because they describe how a word is used. So, for example, a right descriptive definition, a pen is an instrument for writing which has a hard tip through which ink is applied onto the paper. This is a correct descriptive definition. Then I can have a wrong descriptive definition. A pen is a bird with red feathers. This is not a pen, something else. So um, you have to distinguish here between right and wrong descriptive definition. And you can do it because we all know what a pen is. So we describe something that we already know. Descriptive definitions describe how a word is used and therefore they can be right or wrong. If the definition describes correctly how the word is used, then it's right. If it describes it wrongly, then it's wrong, obviously. Stipulative definitions, as opposed to this, introduce a new word to the language or a new meaning for a known word. Therefore, they can never be wrong because the meaning is new or the word is new. Okay? So what is an example of a stipulative definition here? When I say trair, I want the word to mean three-legged chair. This is a stipulative definition because the word trair does not exist before I say this. I just made it up. There is no word trair in the dictionary. But I can make my own words if I like, right? I can tell to my children, you know, from now on we call this three-leg chair a trayer. And, and we can do it. Nobody can prevent us from doing that, right? So this can never be wrong. Nobody can come and say, no, no, a trayer is something different. A trayer is nothing. The word doesn't exist. It's my word. I own it. I do what I want with it, right? So this is a stipulative definition. Now you would think stipulative definitions like this are, are pretty useless or I invented a new game. I would call it Greek chess. Um, you would think this is rare, right? That people create new words. But actually it's not. It's pretty common because new things are created all the time, right? So uh, when culture or technology advances, for example, astronaut, microwave, PDA, mobile phone, bungee jumping, Blu-ray disc. So all these are relatively recent words that didn't exist 50 years ago, most of them, or 100 years ago, right? So these are new words. Um, many more you can think of, computer, you know, all kinds of things. Um, and therefore, stipulative definitions are important. And the first time the word is used, you, you must see that the definition 
type of definition changes, right? The first time this is used, it's a stipulative definition. So the first time somebody pulls the cord out of a phone and says, now I stick, you know, some antennas there and make this into a phone that I can use without the cord, then this becomes a new, this is a new thing. And so when he says, I call this mobile phone, then you have a stipulative definition because this thing did not exist before in this form. And the word mobile phone did not exist before. But after this thing has been named, the word mobile phone now enters the language and we all know what a mobile phone is. And from now on, if I ask you to define a mobile phone, you are not anymore giving a stipulative definition. Now you are giving a descriptive definition because we all know what a mobile phone is, right? So a stipulative definition was given only once for a term, right? And after that, we know the term and the definition becomes descriptive. So let's see if you have understood this again in exercise. Now please stop the video here, look at this exercise and tell me which of these definitions, I, I will put the camera lower so you can see my hands, which do all the magic here. Um, a chair is a piece of furniture with a straight back for sitting upon. Is this stipulative or is it descriptive? Uh, let's call the new star that was discovered yesterday fairy star. James is the name that I will give to my new son, to my, to my first son. Water we call the substance which in chemistry is known as H2O. So please look at these and tell me what kind of definition do you see in each one of those? Are these descriptive or stipulative? Okay, so we can continue. You, you have stopped the video, right? We can continue and see the answer. Oops, the answer, here we are. A chair is a piece of furniture with a straight back and so on is descriptive. Why? Because we all know what a chair is, right? There's nobody who doesn't know a chair. Let's call the new star that was discovered yesterday, fairy star. This now is descriptive. Why? Because the star before didn't have a name. It was discovered yesterday. So by giving it a name, I create a new word uh, or a new meaning for the word fairy star. And therefore, this is stipulative. James is the name that I will give to my first son. This is stipulative, again, because nobody can say, no, no, your first son is going to be called Peter. Uh, it's, it's my son, right? Whatever I want is his name. If I want to call him James, he's James. And therefore, um, this is a stipulative definition. I have the power to give a new meaning to James, to the word James, to describe this person. Uh, therefore, this is stipulative. But water, we know already. So I cannot redefine water. Therefore, the, f the fourth example here, if I would say, for example, water, we call the substance which in chemistry is known as CO2, you would tell me this is wrong. Water is not that, right? And you would be right. So um, we all know water, and therefore this is a descriptive definition. It can be right or wrong. So now let's see another distinction between definitions. We also can look at these two. An astronaut is a person trained to fly to space or astronauts are people like Neil Armstrong, Edwin Aldrin and Yang Li Wei. So now if you look at these two, you see that there is a different type of definition here, right? And what is the difference? The difference is that the first, you know, I think of it for a moment, perhaps I shouldn't tell you, look at it and then I continue. Okay, stop the video, do this thing, and then when you're finished, come here and we continue. So, now, what is the difference? The first one, um, or let's start with the second here, an intentional definition, right? Intentional definition specifies the conditions for something to be a member of a specific set. So you give a, a number of conditions, <clears throat> and these are the conditions that have to be fulfilled for something to be a member of a specific set, in this case, the set of all things that are astronauts. So what does this mean? What are the conditions for something to be a member of the set astronaut? What, what is an astronaut, right? It's a person who is trained to fly to space. So it must be a human, it must be trained to fly to space, then it's an astronaut. So astronauts are people who are trained to fly to space. So this definition gives you the properties that things must have in order to be in the set of all astronauts. While extensional definitions don't name properties, 
but instead they give you examples. An extensional definition just lists all or some members of the set that you want to define. Vehicles are cars, trucks and buses. This doesn't tell you anything about what the properties of vehicles are and what makes a thing a vehicle. It just tells you vehicles are these kinds of things. Examples. These three are vehicles. And because our brain can, you know, generalize from examples, we get an idea of what kind of thing this is. Fruit are apples, bananas and mangoes. Um, so these are extensional definitions. If you want to remember it, because sometimes it's difficult, you confuse intentional and extensional. Remember the X? Extensional definitions are those that give examples. Hmm? X, X, extensional example. And the intentional definitions are the others. Okay, do it yourself now. Uh, another exercise. Define vehicle, Chinese cooking and fruit intentionally. Okay, so take a break here, stop this video, do it, then come back and I will explain it. Here we are. A vehicle is a self-moving container used for transporting people or goods, especially on land, for example. This is, again, it's not perfect. You will find surely counter examples of this thing, um, but you know, it's good enough in order to be able to communicate. Even if someone doesn't speak English well and he, you know, he doesn't know the word vehicle and you give him this definition afterwards, you will be able to talk to him reasonably about vehicles. It doesn't matter that perhaps there's a counter example, but you know, it fulfills its purpose of making communication possible. Chinese cooking is a method of preparation of food which has originated and is typically used in the PRC, Taiwan, Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, and the details then of this definition would depend on whether you want to actually focus more on defining Chinese because your, your partner in communication knows what cooking is, but he's not sure what Chinese cooking is, or whether you want to define cooking because the other person perhaps understands Chinese, but they don't know what cooking means. So then you would focus on different things, right, in your definition. But the one problem here is you shouldn't define Chinese cooking in a way that says Chinese cooking is cooking as done by the Chinese. This is relatively useless as a definition because if the other person in the communication doesn't know cooking or Chinese, that this is just rephrasing it using the same words. So you don't actually provide more information, right? You should always try not to make these circular definitions where you define something and, and use the same word on the right side because this doesn't actually give any information. You should always try to describe the words with other words so that if somebody doesn't know the first word at least he can understand the explanation okay fruit are usually sweet and fleshy parts of plants that contain seeds that are edible by humans usually raw um, again you will find you know fruits that are not fleshy or fruits that are not sweet or all kinds of things fruits that are not eaten raw um, but Okay, this is good enough. If you say this to somebody who doesn't know the word fruit, he will be able to, in his mind, you know, understand and, and provide in his own language a translation that probably will also mean fruit. Okay? So, we have another word sometimes, reportive definitions, is another word for what we call descriptive definition. You know, all this critical thinking is, is has a long history. Centuries ago, it started with Aristotle, you know, um, first person to do critical thinking 2,000 years ago. And since then, all kinds of people have thought about it uh, in different languages. And they gave these concepts different terms. And historically, some of these terms have stayed uh, on. And so there are multiple words to describe the same thing. This is just a result of a long history of this field. And so some people call it reportive, some people call it descriptive. It's exactly the same thing. Okay. Um, but then we have another thing, precising definition. Now a precising definition is a combination of reportive and stipulative definition. Because the aim of a precising definition is to make the meaning of a term more precise for some purpose, although we know what the term generally means. Right? So this would be something like a company who might want to give discounts to old people. 
So if the company just says, you know, old people get this thing uh, for half the price, then oh, everybody would go there and try to argue, you know, look at me, I have white hair and I'm old and uh, I cannot walk, you know, and I'm always coughing uh, and, and try to get this thing cheap. And you could start, you know, whenever you have your first white hair, you could start arguing, I'm old. Uh, so in your 30s, for example. So this wouldn't do, right? Uh, you have to have a more precise definition of what old means. And although generally we know what old people means, it's not like we would call, you know, a baby an old people uh, or a 30-year-old. We know what old people is, but sometimes it needs to be more precise. And this is what a precising definition is doing. So you would say an old person means a person of age 65 or above or something like this. And this then becomes a precising definition. And from now on, if we do this, we know what an old person is supposed to be. And now we can, you know, say when you want a discount, you have to show me your passport or your, your ID card. And if you are over 65, you get this cheaper, otherwise not. Okay. But there are multiple definitions of old. It doesn't need to be this. It can be another definition, right? So this is precising, means we generally know what it is, but not precisely. And the definition provides a more precise um, interpretation of this word. And in this sense, it is like a stipulative definition, because this precision you cannot question. If it has been precised in this way by the shop, then this is their definition. Another example, Lignan University Administration tells you a full-time student is a student who takes at least three courses each semester. So roughly we know what the full-time student means. It's not like we had completely don't have an idea what the word means. But we don't know exactly. Do you need three courses? Do you need four courses? So saying that is a student who takes at least three courses makes it clear to everybody this is what we mean when we talk of a full-time student. Okay? And again, you cannot argue with them. You cannot say, no, no, a full-time student is something different. It's not a full-time student. is whatever Lingnan says it is. Okay. So what is correct as one type of definition need not be correct as another type. For example, a full-time student is a student who takes at least two courses each term. This is at least two. Yeah, I changed it. So this now is wrong. Presently, as a reportive definition, because we just saw full-time students need to take three courses. So this is actually wrong. But if it's a precising definition by the university administration, if they say it, from now on full-time students only need to take two courses each semester, then suddenly this becomes right. This becomes a correct definition, a precising definition. And there is no debate about this, right? You cannot argue with them. So. Um, this would be wrong as a reportive, but correct as a precise, precising definition. So now let's have one look. Which of these definitions are descriptive, which are stipulative, and which are precising? Look at them carefully and try to give each one the right label. Okay, so here we are. Um, I changed the light a little because it was getting dark, so now I'm you know, a little darker in the face. Uh, but we will see the answer now to this here, okay? So, uh, descriptive, I write a D in front of it, stipulative, I write an S, and precising, I write a P, and that's how it looks. So the first one is descriptive, why? Because my definition describes what the telephone is. It dis we know what the telephone is, um, and uh, we we can describe it correctly. We can give a correct descriptive definition or a, or a, a wrong one, um, and so um, we can judge whether the definition is right or wrong. And so this is uh, what makes it a descriptive definition. <clears throat> and the second, Jane is a woman who is my wife. Here, many people are confused by the other example, uh, which was about the uh, my son. James, right? But there's a difference. The difference is that I cannot rename my son. No, I cannot rename my wife, right? Because my wife already has a name. It's in her passport. I cannot just rename my wife, right? But I can rename my son. So um, I can decide my son should be called, you know, James or he should be called Peter. But I cannot decide my wife 
from tomorrow should not be called Sandy anymore. She should be called Jane. This I cannot do. So this is why the one is descriptive and the other is stipulative, right? The name of my wife is descriptive because I don't have a power to change it. I can just, the word already has a meaning. My wife already has a name and I, I cannot change it. While uh, for my son, I can change the name and this is why it's stipulative. NDT is a drink that I made up that's composed of tea and so on. This is stipulative, right? NDT doesn't exist before the word. I make it up. Um, under the terms of this regulation, a Chinese person is a person who holds a Chinese passport. This is clearly stipulative, right? We, we know what a Chinese person is, but for this regulation, we have to give a more precise definition of Chinese because Chinese could be all kinds of things, born in China, born by Chinese parents, speaking Chinese, living in China. So we need to say it's a holder of a Chinese passport. This makes it clear what Chinese means for this purpose here, whatever it is. And finally, Fido is the name that I will give to my new dog. This is stipulative because I create a new name uh, for this dog that didn't exist before. Okay, uh, I hope this makes it clear. Now we have more exercises of this type, intentional or extensional. Um, the first one drinks a tea, coffee and lemonade. And so I don't want to read everything, you just read it. Uh, stop the video here, read it, do the exercise and we'll discuss it in a moment. Okay. So the first one is extensional because it's examples, right? Tea, coffee and lemonade. The second is intentional because it gives you the properties of a bicycle, two wheels powered by the driver. The third is extensional, gives you examples. Educational institutions are primary schools, secondary schools and universities, examples. The next one is intentional. A truck is a big car that is used for transporting goods is intentional. It gives you a property, big, trans use for transporting goods and so on. Now we can compare definitions, first extensionally and then intentionally, and then we can try to see which is easier, right? So try just one example now. You will see the rest in the lecture notes. I don't, I don't need to do all the examples here with you, right? So define first extensionally and then intentionally. Let's, let's try to say, for example, um, vegetable or something. So how do you describe extensionally vegetable? Try to do this. Stop a moment here and try to do this. Okay, so um, extensionally means you give examples, right? So a vegetable is potato, a tomato or a carrot. Give at least three so that we have some idea what you mean. Um, and then I can try to define it intentionally by giving properties. A vegetable is a part of, an, of a plant uh, that is edible, um, normally not sweet. Um, that's it, right? It's difficult to say more. So, yeah, so if you try this and you try to see which is easier, you find out, of course, extensional definitions are easier because you don't have to think of all these properties and to find the right properties that are not, you know, ambiguous and that uh, are clear enough. Uh, so in extensional definition, you just um, uh, find some examples. And so it's much easier, uh, but they're less precise because a, a word that you don't know can actually describe many different things. And you can never be entirely sure from extensional definition what the word is describing. And sometimes they can be very confusing. For example, <coughs> I have this Greek word, the asymos, and I can say in Greek, the asymos means people like, for example, Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, and Vladimir Putin. And now what did I, what if, did I define here, right? If you look at it, what does this mean, really, the word? I mean, I gave you an extensional definition. You should be able to say what it is. But it's not so easy because it could mean politician. It could mean bad politician who doesn't care about democracy. It could mean man. It could mean person who can speak English. But the word actually means famous, right? So you see that there are many candidates for the meaning of a word that we define only extensionally because a few examples can never completely uh, describe precisely what I want to say. It can always be something else for which these three examples also fit, right? 
Intentional definitions are harder to give, but they have the advantage that they uh, are much more precise. Right? So first you need to think harder about the properties of things and how different sets of properties relate to each other, but then they are more precise, and this is why they are used in science. They are usually very clear. So a scientific definition is most often an intentional definition, and this is what we generally associate with definitions. If you ask people on the street, you know, what is a definition, they will tell you um, an example of an intentional definition, probably. Okay, important to note is that there is no connection between these two pairs of concepts. So intentional, extensional, descriptive, stipulative, um, there is no connection. Some people think, okay, every intentional definition must be descriptive. It's not true. So you can have intentional and descriptive. Intentional, you know, remember, means a give a description of the properties. And descriptive means I know what the word is. So a chair is a piece of furniture. I know a chair, so it's descriptive, which is used for sitting upon. It has three or four legs. And this makes it then intentional because I'm providing properties. Or intentional and stipulative. I give the properties, so it's, you know, intentional, but of something that does not yet exist. So this makes it um, intentional. I call Greek chess a game which has the following rules, and then I give the rules. Now I can also have extensional and descriptive. Descriptive means I know what the word means, like a fruit, but extensional means I give it through examples. So a fruit is something like a banana, an apple, or an orange. And finally, I can have extensional and stipulative. Greek chess is something like chess, Chinese chess, or checkers. So I define a new word, stipulative, in a way that I do it by giving examples. And so this makes it extensional. So you can have all four combinations, right? This is very important to be aware of. So if you look at more examples of intentional definitions now, more examples of intentional definitions, you see a table is a piece of furniture which is used for placing things upon. Air is the gas which surrounds the planet Earth. A mobile phone is a phone which can be carried around and used on the way. Now look at the structure of these. Can you see how these definitions are made? If you look at the structure, you can see it, right? They all have the same structure. They are called definitions by genus, family, and difference. Genus is just Latin for family. Um, the genus is the family of things something belongs to. So I say table is of the genus piece of furniture. So a table is from the family piece of furniture. A air is from the family gas. Mobile phone is of the family phone, or I could say, you know, technological device or communication device or something like that. So what is the genus of these things? Now it's an exercise again. Stop the video. Try to find the genus of these things here. Okay, so we are back. Uh, an elephant is of the genus mammal or animal. A computer is of the genus electronic device. A university is of the genus educational institution. A student is of the genus um, human, human being, or occupation. And rice is of the genus plant or dish. You can see that multiple words, some words, have multiple genera, you know, families to which they belong. And actually everything has an endless number of families to which it belongs. So I can say this thing here happens to be the remote control of my air conditioner. Um, this is in the family of remote controls. It's also in the family of electronic devices. It's also in the family of things that are white on the back and made of plastic. It's also in the family of rectangular things. It's also in the family of things that break if I throw them to the floor, you know. It's also in the things of my family of non-edible things. Okay? So everything is like that. Everything has multiple genera, you know. I am a man, I am a human, I am a white person, I am someone with short hair, I am a teacher, I am a person wearing a red t-shirt. So I belong to many, many families of things. Um, and you cannot say, you know, I'm only the one, right? So everything in reality belongs to many different classes. And now how do we deal with that when we give a definition? Uh, sometimes 
it is sometimes it's easier so we pick the closest definition the closest game so for example for the elephant I can say mammal or animal I prefer to say mammal because it's the smallest group because later I have to say what distinguishes the elephant for, from the other members of the group right an elephant is an animal which an elephant is a mammal which has some special property making it an elephant so then I can ask which is easier to to do later it's easier if I start with a smaller group because then I have excluded all the things that are not in the smaller group they're already excluded so if I say it's an animal that is big and gray it could be you know some some big gray fish if I say it's a mammal that is big and gray the fish are already gone so now I can concentrate on the mammals and say okay an elephant is a mammal that is big and gray perhaps there are not so many of them this is why you never want in a definition to start by saying think an elephant is a thing that <clears throat> this is you're wasting your opportunity to make a precise definition by taking the closest possible family right never say thing try to be specific in the family <clears throat> but sometimes it's not wrong rice is truly either a dish or a plant a student is truly a human or an occupation so in these cases you cannot say that one is right and the other is wrong or one is better and the other is worse it's just true that both are good and it depends on the properties that you want to emphasize so if I am a cook you know I will not think of the rice as a plant I will think of the rice as a dish it's, it's my job is cooking I'm, I'm not don't care if it has you know five leaves or six leaves uh, arranged you know symmetrically or not um, I just want to eat it um, while if I'm a farmer then I'm not don't care about the eating a, a farmer doesn't is not interested in how to cook the rice a farmer is interested in how to grow the plant so for him the rice is a plant primarily right and the same about students right if I want to hire a student then the student is an occupation I don't really care about the body of the student a human being if the student was a robot and was equally well doing you know the job I could hire the robot so I'm, I don't care really if the student is a, a man or a woman or a robot or an alien right as long as it's a student it's good enough for me to hire so this is the occupation aspect while um, if I if I say you know uh, I want to design an air conditioner like the thing we just had here right an air conditioner uh, for a, a room in a university where 30 students are sitting there it is important that I'm talking about human bodies right because an air conditioner need to be dimensioned so that it can provide air for 30 human bodies so having 30 robots would have different requirements or having 30 you know old people would be different from having 30 20 year olds uh, because their metabolism is different they, they breathe in different rates and so on 30 babies so uh, there it is important that I have biological human beings so I cannot just say you know uh, I have 30 occupations sitting in this room occupations don't need air conditioners right but human bodies do so this is why you would there emphasize in this context you would emphasize the the bodiness the humanness of the student and not so much the occupation side okay so the difference is what makes oh yeah okay so stop back so this was the genus and I told you that we have the genus and the difference right so the difference now is the second part of the definition is what makes this particular thing different from the other members of the genus and in a definition it often appears after the word which like a spaceship is a vehicle which flies into space <clears throat> so spaceship is what you want to define vehicle is the genus the more general category into which spaceships fall and now what makes a spaceship different from other vehicles it flies into space that's the difference so the idea is to say when you give a definition which group something belongs to and what makes it different from all the other members of this group and in this way you can define one single thing the narrower the narrower the genus is the easier it becomes to specify a good difference so this is why you want to have the genus as narrow as possible because then it becomes easier to specify the difference so mammal is a better genus than animal 
uh, electronic device is a better game as the machine. Any concrete class of things is better than just think because this limits already your group of things and then you can more easily pick out something with a difference. So find the difference in order to complete the following definition. What is the difference? Elephant is a mammal, which, what? Computer is an electronic device, which, what? Exercise, do it. Okay, so here we are. Elephant is a mammal which is big and has a long nose. Again, we are not going for a perfect definition. We are going for a definition that is understandable enough so that we can communicate. For most people, this will clarify what animal we are talking about. A computer is an electronic device which is programmable. This is what makes computers. University is an educational institution which is the highest or a tertiary educational institution. Student is a human who is being educated at an educational institution and a rice is a plant or dish, and depending on whether you see it as a plant or as a dish, you would give different um, difference. Difference. Okay, that's it. So now try it yourself again. Um, give genus difference definitions for the following things cinema, ship, PowerPoint, Apple, and Cantonese pop music. Um, just think a little, you know, and give some genus and, and difference definitions for these things. Um, cinema could be a hall where people buy a ticket to watch movies together. A ship is a vessel which floats on the surface of water. PowerPoint is a computer program for making presentations. Apple could be many things, right? A fruit that is red or green and sweet. It could be the fruit of the apple tree or the computer company which makes the iPhone. Or the fruit that inspired Newton to think about gravitation. So these are all things that you said in previous classes. So uh, there's this collection of things that comes to mind when you say Apple, right? Uh, Cantonese pop music and so on um, is a little more difficult. Then. Okay, problems with definitions now and then we are finished. Have a little patience. I hope in five minutes, ten minutes latest we are through with that. So you saw already with the Apple there's a problem, right? Uh, in one definition I can make create a problem by saying a cook is someone who cooks, right? This is not a good definition. Why not? Because if I don't know what a cook is and I require a definition to tell me what a cook is, then I don't know what cooking means either. So a cook is someone who cooks doesn't provide any information to someone who doesn't know what a cook is. It would be strange if he knew cooks as a verb but, a verb, but didn't know cook as a noun. This is not likely, right? Um, and I can have the same problem with two related definitions. An apple is the fruit of the apple tree. And then I say an apple tree is a tree which produces apples. They're equally useless. If I don't know apple, then I cannot from this definition understand what we are talking about. So the thing is that circular definitions like this don't define anything really and only seem to make sense because we already know the word. Um, to see how they don't make sense, replace the word as being defined by something meaningless. Let's say tagaf. A tagaf is someone who tagafs. Can you say what a tagaf is? There's no meaning to tagaf. Don't, don't try to look it up. It has no meaning. It's a word that just made up. Okay? A tagaf is someone who tagafs. This is supposed to be the same as a cook is someone who cooks, number one here, right? A cook is someone who cooks. But if I don't know the, what cook means, for me, this sounds like a tagaf is someone who tagafs. Right? This is a useless definition. This could be uh, almost everything, right? Someone who tagafs could be a writer, someone who writes, a cook is someone who cooks, a philosopher is someone who philosophizes. It doesn't tell me anything about what it actually is. Or, tagaf is the fruit of the tagaf tree. A tagaf tree is a tree which produces tagafs. Again, same problem. I cannot say what a tagaf is. It could be apples, bananas, oranges. Okay, I know it's a, it's a product of a tree, right? But that's all. I don't know anything more than that. Okay, so, but now you can make the same test with a correct definition to see how nicely this would work if your definition was good. So a tagaf, you say, is a hall where people have to buy a ticket in order to watch a movie together. Now, if I say this with tagaf in there, you still understand what I mean. A hall where people have to buy a ticket in order to watch movies together. This must be a cinema, right? This is a good definition. I don't know the word cinema or tagaf, but the definition is good. I understand what the concept is that is being described. <coughs> 
So this is a test for definitions. You can test whether a definition is a good one by replacing the word which is being defined by a meaningless word. And if you can still understand what is being defined, then you have a good definition. So let's try another example. A tug of is something which is a lot of fun and excitement. Is this a good definition or not? Think of it. Right. So this is not a good definition. It can be so many things, right? Uh, it could be, um, you know, uh, I thought there were some examples here. So it could be um, a lot of fun and excitement, a roller coaster. It could be um, a game, a computer game. It could be a book. It could be doing critical thinking exercises. Lots of fun and excitement, okay? All these things. So we don't know what exactly it is. But if I say a tagaf is a red, round, soft vegetable used to make ketchup. What is it? You know, all, you all know immediately what this is. No problem with the word tagaf there. We all know what this is, right? It's clearly a potato. Right, so definitions are not always objective. That's another problem of definitions. Some definitions are persuasive, means they try to transfer an emotion instead of just giving information about what the thing is. They try to make you feel in a particular way about the thing, good or bad, right? So for example, you can say Greece is a South European country located between Italy and Turkey. This was kind of objective, tells you where Greece is. But you can say Greece is a South European country that was home to a great ancient civilization. This is persuasive. It doesn't actually provide much information, right? Because, you know, many countries are home to great ancient civilizations. Italy also was, and, and Turkey probably was, and, uh, you know, Macedonia was, uh, and Spain was. Um, so all these countries are home uh, to, to great ancient civilizations. So this doesn't actually define anything. It just gives you a feeling, feeling good about Greece. Um, persuasive definition with negative feelings also, right? Common, homosexuals. Somebody who is attracted by the same sex. This is a kind of objective definition of what it means to be homosexual. But you could say homosexual is somebody who has an unnatural desire for those of the same sex. And if you say it like this, it immediately becomes unnatural, becomes negative, right? Becomes something bad. So this looks, this is the danger with these definitions. It looks like it is objective, but it tries to smuggle in the feeling to make you feel bad about it, right? The same China is a country occupying the easternmost part of the Asian continent. This is kind of an objective uh, definition, but you could say, although perhaps it's not so good because there are other things like Korea or something that also would fit the definition. Uh, but um, you can also say a country in Asia home to many great poets and philosophers. This is a positive persuasive definition or negative persuasive definition. China is a country in Asia home to many poor people. Again, um, both these two and three definitions are not good. They're persuasive and they're not good definitions because all countries in Asia, uh, almost all probably, are home to many great poets and philosophers, right? You can imagine many poets and philosophers in Japan and many in Korea and there are tons of them in India. And, you know, it's really countries in Asia are full of great poets and philosophers. So there's no distinction there to say, you know, this is something that specifies that I'm speaking about China. Uh, and, and home to many poor people. I mean, the, the world is full of poor people everywhere, right? It's not in Germany. It's also home to many poor people. So it's nothing specific to China. And so again, these are bad definitions because now they, they transport a feeling and emotion without actually helping you distinguish what the thing is, right? It is being defined. So they can be hard to detect because they masquerade kind of as objective descriptions of the world but they pretend to be objective, but in reality, they try to persuade you. Single words can also be persuasive, right? You have words like chairman, which we are used to, the chairman, you know, of a company, but in reality, you know, this persuades you to think of a man instead of a woman, right? Chairperson would be better, more objective. A cop or a police officer, cop is negative, right? Perceived negative. A house or a home, so here the house is the more objective version. 
A home gives you a positive feeling about being at home. My home is my castle. You know, all these positive associations of home is something that protects you and relaxes you and so on. The guy over there or the man over there or the gentleman over there, you can see how these sound different, right? You wouldn't say probably loud so that he can hear you, the guy over there, but you would say the gentleman over there, right? So these are all persuasive vocabulary. It's not a definition now, it's a vocabulary, a word, but also has this kind of persuasive content. So now let's try to locate the problems in these following definitions. One, two, three, four, five. Um, I would like to leave you alone with this. Um, this video is long enough and I don't think that we need to prolong it much more. But this is a good exercise, so do that please. Stop the video and Later, uh, I will briefly step through this and show you the answers. All these answers are what we already know, um, what we just talked about, you know, the persuasive, they're too broad, they're too narrow, they don't have gainers and difference. Um, so compare, do the exercise first, come back and compare with my answers here and see if you agree, if you had the same solutions, right? Like what you can see here, okay? And you have more exercises again here. Is this a good definition? Physics is a systematic study of object processes and properties that are physical in nature. Think about it, stop the video. Obviously not, right? This is circular. Uh, if you don't know what physics is, you would not know what physical in nature means. Philosophy is the light that shines upon the dark corners of knowledge. Good definition or not? Obviously, answer coming here. No, it is persuasive. It's a wrong metaphorical genus, right? It's, it's philosophy is not a light. It's a field of study or something like that. So the genus is wrong. And it's too general. You could say the same of, you know, history, for example. A religion is a fairy tale used for indoctrinating the uneducated. What's wrong with that? Persuasive language, too general. You could say the same of many other, you know, you could say the same of Medicine is a fairy tale, you know, if you don't believe in modern medicine or something like that. To swim is to move the body forward through water with limbs, fins or tail. This is a funny one, actually. Uh, stop here for a moment. What's wrong here? Yeah, uh, first, you don't have to move the body forward, right? You can swim backwards. Second, to move through water is not necessarily the case. I can swim in milk, right? People have done this in the past. Rich, rich, you know, women, queens used to swim in milk in order to get this nice white skin. Um, so um, this is all not really a good definition. To discriminate against the person is to treat that person wrongly without good justification. Again, it's not a good definition, various problems. Think about them yourself before you continue, right? Too general includes stealing and lying, right? If I treat a person wrongly without justification, this is also what a thief does when he steals your uh, wallet. But the, you wouldn't say the thief is discriminating, right? So this is just too general. A girl refers to any young female human being. What about this definition? And now you see this definition is actually a good definition, right? So if you if you found all kinds of flaws with this, then I tricked you successfully, because this is a good definition, right? A girl is actually a young female human being, so there is nothing wrong with that. Okay, so we talked today about descriptive, stipulative, precise, sing, reportive, intentional and extensional definitions. You need to know all these words, you need to distinguish them, you need to be able to give examples of them. We talked about genus and difference, we talked about circular definitions and common definition errors. And if you have understood all this, you are perfectly ready for the final exam on the chapter of definitions. Okay, so thank you. That was all. Excuse the lighting here. I mean, I don't have a professional studio. We are right now in my bedroom. That's it. So, um, uh, again, sorry about the light, but um, the light of knowledge, you know, shines bright. Uh, within these videos, so I hope this can compensate for the bad light from upstairs. Okay, see you next time. Thank you and goodbye.